Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Terry Martin, and I'm with the National Alliance for Public Safety GIS Foundation. Thank you all for joining us for this prep tech talk on applying drones and imagery for disaster management. Prep tech talks are a virtual seminar series where we come together to address key challenges and adoption, implementation, and use of the most effective advanced technologies, all with a goal of strengthening our collective community, unifying efforts, and building capacity of public safety leaders, first responders, technologists, and GIS practitioners. I have with me today, Charlotte Abel and Jared Duke from the NAPSIG team who will be assisting me with the chat and the Q&A. Panelists will be addressing your questions via the Q&A and if time allows, we'll select a few at the end to go through. Additionally, to give our panelists an understanding of our audience today, please answer a couple quick questions on your current drone capabilities and use of imagery for disaster management, either using the QR code we shared or Mentilink provided in the chat. We also have an incredible panel of leaders in the use of imagery and drones during disasters that I will introduce in just a moment. Now I'm very excited that you have all joined us for our latest prep tech talk. This is part one of a two part series, applying drones and imagery for disaster management. So with that, we'll move into our objectives of today. You'll hear about how drones are transforming disaster response missions nationwide the keys to developing a successful public safety UAS program, learn how your agency can leverage an organization like Civil Air Patrol and their drone capacity during a disaster, and finally hear the latest innovations in imagery collection, exploitation, and artificial intelligence for imagery-derived disaster intelligence. So we are very excited to have this tremendous panel that are going to help us reach those objectives. With us today are Charles Werner from Drone Responders Public Safety Alliance, Austin Rochester from Civil Air Patrol, and Chris Todd with Airborne International Response Team. I will do more thorough introductions as we get to the presentation port portion. I want to thank our esteemed panelists for being with us today. So as you can see, we have a full agenda for the hour to ensure our panelists have plenty of time and we have the opportunity for questions I'm gonna get us started with just a little background on NAPSIG. So for those who are new to our organization, I'd like to just briefly talk about who we are. The National Alliance for Public Safety GIS Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. We have a national network of over 20,000 members, both public safety and GIS practitioners alike, representing local, state, tribal, county levels. And our organization is governed by an independent board of directors that are primarily public safety practitioners with 30 plus years of experience in the field. We formed about 15 years ago as an alliance between a number of prominent national associations, some of which you see here, and have evolved into a formal organization over the course of that time. Our vision as an organization is listed here, but at its core is to help build a nation of emergency responders and leaders equipped with the knowledge and skills in applying technology and data to change the outcomes of survivors and really working towards building a more resilient nation. Our reach is primarily national with the 20,000 members that I mentioned, but you can see from the map who uh, is on our webinar today, at least those that we were able to map based on zip code. I believe since we grabbed this the screenshot, we reached over 600 participants total. But this is a pretty good cross section across the country and a mix of disciplines, levels of government and the private sector. Additionally, if I zoomed out, you would see a decent international participation today that is not captured in this screenshot. So what is our goal? It is to help to get first responders, operators and decision makers the right actionable information at the right time. And how do we work towards this goal? Well, largely through defining and promulgating the consistent use of best practices and we do this through the development of national guidelines and standards. We work to encourage and foster collaboration, and we do this through regional exercises and simulations. This also helps us to document challenges, what worked well and further validate and or update guidance based on those activities. Additionally, through education and training like we're doing today, we aim to build the capacity of the community, which is our mission. And finally, we work to transfer that knowledge and skills to the community. We do this from org to org transfer, videos and written tutorials, toolkits, and so on. Shown here are just some of the resources we provide to support the implementation of standards and best practices and to ultimately transfer the knowledge and those skills. 
I would encourage you to visit this page as we do regularly add new tools and resources to support your mission. So next I'd like to just check in on the results of our first mentee question. So thank you all for participating. This helps give us a sense of where your agencies are with implementing a drone program. And it looks like about half of the participants today uh, currently have a drone program. 30% are in development and 35 not quite yet. Our panelists are going to speak to considerations and resources regardless of the maturity of your organization as it relates to a drone program and leveraging imagery for disaster management. But this does help us understand our audience a little better and where the community stands at large. So with that, I'm excited to introduce our first panelist, Charles Werner is the retired Charlottesville Fire Chief and 46 year public safety veteran. After retirement, Charles worked with the Virginia Department of Emergency Management for two years as a senior advisor and acting deputy state coordinator. Charles served in numerous leadership roles at the local, state, national levels on public safety initiatives and presently serves as director of Drone Responders Public Safety Alliance, board of directors on Airborne International Response Team and appointed by Virginia Governor Northam to serve on the Secure and Resilient Commonwealth Panel and serve as Public Safety UAS sub-panel chair. Chief Werner is a FAA certified remote pilot and also serves on the Virginia Center for Innovative Technologies Unmanned Systems Advisory Board. Thank you for joining us today, Charles. I will go ahead and turn it over to you. Thanks, Terry, and thanks to the uh, NAPSIC Foundation Are you able to hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry, my signal is telling me it's muted. Okay, let me restart here. Uh, thank you, Terry, and thanks to the NAPSIC Foundation for all the great work that's been done. I had the opportunity and, and privilege to serve on the board for 10 years and uh, know just how much work is being done, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here to speak. So one of the things I want to do before we get started is to ask you a question. Would you ever put your personnel or citizens in harm's way unnecessarily? And as we go through and look at the use cases that we're now seeing that are being used by public safety, think about this question in what you're able to see. On the first example, you can see in a structure fire, if you look to the right side of this picture, you can see the major body of fire to the left and to the right, you can see an exposure fire that started from flying brands that have landed on the top of a, a roof of another structure. Without this visual uh, oversight, you would not necessarily see this until somebody called much later and damage could have been much worse. Here's a case of thermal image cameras used uh, on the drone to give us the thermal imaging and this, the heat signatures that we can look at. On the left, you can see the structure and the damage to the roof. In some places, you can see that the heat signature shows the roof is actually gone. This is particularly important as firefighters are gonna be operating on roofs. This is the most dangerous area. This would give us indications not to put someone on there and put someone in harm's way. On the right, you'll see a second alarm assignment and FDNY launches a drone for every second alarm or greater fire. And you can see firefighters operating on the roof in the lower and the upper levels. Here's another example of that thermal view. And on the left, you can see the smoke is blocking a lot of the vision. On the right, you can actually see the thermal signature and the firefighting, uh, the fire as it's happening. And you can also see master streams being applied to determine if they're in the appropriate place. Here you can see another indication of a drone view from the Notre Dame fire in France. Uh, they were able to use drones in this case to significantly help in locating where to make the best uh, attack for suppression to prevent the fire from spreading into the other parts of the cathedral. Again, when you are responding to an incident like this, might be a traffic or transportation accident uh, on a highway and you may have limited access to get to it, the drone can provide you with invaluable information as to what you're looking at and as we like to say in the drone world, it tells you how bad is bad. Particularly important with NAPSIG uh, and the whole idea of GIS and imagery is now we have seen that we can take information that's coming from incidents, uh, put them on a map to show where data and remote sensing is available and then be able to click on that. Each one of these dots represents specific data. And as we click on it, we can actually see the damage that's been documented in that area. This happens to be a hangar photograph and hangar creates a 360 degree view, which allows uh, 
the ability to see information in front of you or to make a 360 turn. And you can even zoom in on this because it's vi very high resolution imagery. Another thing that we're seeing is that um, we're able to use this in a dashboard type setting to where you can have uh, a slide rule that goes back and forth that shows the before and after. So it shows the severity of the magnitude. We've also seen Chula Vista Police Department um, drone as a first responder where they dispatch uh, the drone from the immediate time of a call. And that gets to the scene very quickly. And you can see statistics from uh, 7 15 2020, they had responded with the drone to 2,881 calls, uh, assisted in 373 arrests, deployed uh, in the time where they could uh, avoid dispatching a patrol unit 687 times, first on the scene 1,207 out of the 2,881 times, with the average response time when they're first on the scene of 108 seconds. So you start seeing that they're able to get over a situation, determine if it needs to be increased in priority, decreased in priority, even return units to service. And I know that the Chula Vista Fire Department is now involved with that as well. So we're looking, we're curious to see how that plays out and what kind of role it helps them as they're looking at incidents. Search and rescue is, uh, is a big, has been one of the biggest areas that we have seen drones use. In this case, you can see in the UK, this is actually a snapshot of a video and as they see this person that's identified by the GPS location, uh, they also happen to be able to see the person wave their arms through this thermal image view. Uh, there was a huge cheer of all the people that were watching the screen. And uh, what you can also see is that to the immediate left of that, that location of the person are bodies of water. And what you can't see off screen is rescuers as they're making their approach, they're able to be warned about that water so that they don't uh, go in harm's way. Um, here's a situation, a uh, protest march in Richmond, Virginia. Um, in this case, they decided to have an unscheduled protest march, and so they didn't know where it was going to go, but the drone was able to stay two blocks in advance, specifically for the purpose of uh, stopping the traffic with motorcycles so that they could prevent pedestrian traffic uh, conflict. Okay, I'm frozen. Let's see. Okay. Um, in Hurricane Harvey and the hurricanes that followed, we were able to use the drones uh, to determine how bad is bad. That term we like to use as I repeat myself. But we have had record flooding in areas and damage in areas that have never been damaged by hurricanes before. So this gives us that quick look of how many resources are we going to need to, to recover? Next slide. Uh, in Alabama tornado, we saw for the first time on the news that drones uh, and ground searching was occurring simultaneously. This is one of the first times that we heard uh, drones being put in at the very beginning of a response. And we're seeing that a lot more now because of uh, the value that it brings to the operation that we're having. Next slide. And again, we had uh, volcanic activity in Hawaii, which changed uh, the, the situations where we needed to have information on a regular basis. In this case, it may be watching the lava flow as it moved towards structures so that they could also uh, evacuate people from uh, the area. Or uh, what was unique to this is they were also able to fly drones with sulfur dioxide sensing uh, and, and able to locate this toxic gas, which is invisible and determine the direction of which it was going and be able to evacuate the people, uh, keep them out of harm's way in advance. Next slide. This is a tactical overwatch. Uh, what's important in this is it gives the uh, law enforcement the opportunity to see the lay of the land in advance of uh, their entry. And as they enter, they can, it can watch the activity that takes place. In some cases, people will exit the, the building from different areas, windows, doors, uh, throw drugs into bushes, uh, throw guns on the top of the roof, all this being captured. Next slide. Traffic crash reconstruction really has become very popular and is gaining interest uh, because it can reduce the amount of time that it takes to take the, the measurements for the investigation by a third of the time. And one of the biggest issues that we have 
to deal with is public safety is the secondary accidents. So it reduces those. Next slide. Here we can see a train derailment. Uh, on the left is a fire, on the right is a spill. Uh, we were able to see oftentimes uh, in rural areas where we don't have access, the drone can fly in advance and tell us what cars are involved, how many cars are involved, does it involve hazmat, is it, is it creating a spill into a waterway that needs to be uh, maintained. Next. In critical infrastructure, we're seeing that uh, examples of nuclear power plants and bridges and in, in a dam, like the Orville Dam here, it's being used to look to do normal in infrastructure inspections. Uh, it can also be doing inspection of a bridge following an earthquake, or in the case of Orville Dam, it's looking at the spillway to determine if the spillway damage was going to continue to grow or, or would it be uh, de-escalating. Next slide. Uh, we've seen something interesting that's occurring, uh, a tethered drone. This is an example of the situational awareness system put out by Pierce Manufacturing. They've now uh, put it to where they can install it in a compartment, as you see here, or on the cab of the apparatus. What's unique about this is the drone operates off the tether. That's the power. Now, it also has an emergency battery in it should the power be disconnected for some reason. But this gives you the view in a visual or thermal to a a tablet that is, is held by an operations chief, an incident commander, or whomever, and can see that and switch back and forth between those two views. What's unique about it is these type of operations with tethered drones do not require a remote pilot. So that's entirely different from all the other operations that you've seen. Next slide. Uh, this is an example of AT&T and their, their, their able, ability to fly like they did in Maria and some other places to provide temporary LTE coverage by their drone. Next slide. This is an example of augmented reality. You can take this and add to your flight operations. Uh, this is an example of edge of bees. And in this case, uh, you can add in center lines for streets. You can add in power lines, other information that you want to put in to be able to see. And this becomes very helpful in situations where you have a total devastation of most of your geographic ground references. Uh, in the case of uh, severe hurricanes and wildfires, a lot of the ground features that we recognize are gone. Next slide. So in our spring 2020 survey for drone responders, one of the things we did was ask, how are you using drones? And what we found is that where we had three or four in the beginning that were pretty common to most places, that has expanded to over 17 use cases. So you can see the crime scene investigation, traffic crash reconstruction, incident command and control, hazmat mapping, uh, search and rescue, um, and, and on and on. You can see by this list. I don't need to list them to you. But that just shows the dramatic shift of a few to many operations. Next slide. So what's the state of public safety U.S. programs in 2020? We've, we've learned that U.S. programs are more mature. Uh, they're flying more missions and more types of missions, which has led to the increase in the number of remote pilots. Next slide. So how do drones make a difference in public safety? Number one is safety. It enhances the safety of both civilians and responders by information that we otherwise would not know about or see from the ground. Operational effectiveness by helping us make better decisions by this information and situational awareness in near real time that can be seen locally and or shared to remote locations. And last but not least is in disaster recovery. We can use this as we follow up to see how areas were uh, devastated or in, in situations of inaccessibility, etc., uh, to see the progress that's been made. Next slide. So the question many people ask, do I operate under COA or Part 107? A COA is a certificate of authorization and can only be issued to government agencies or Part 107, which can be done by public safety and or commercial pilots. The answer is both because it provides the most versatility. And the examples of why it adds the most versatility is that under a COA, you can have now what's called the new tactical beyond visual on a site waiver that allows us in very dangerous situations to fly beyond the visual on a site of a remote pilot. It automatically gives us the operations over people and it also provides night operations. Part 107 also gives us flexibility of flying without a visual observer. Next slide. So what's involved in implementing a drone program? It's more than buying and flying. That's the easiest part of the whole program. But you've got to determine your mission types, the type of aircraft you're going to buy, the payloads uh, that are going to provide you 
what you need to meet the mission types, the flight logs, the training, maintenance, batteries, spare equipment, logistics, insurance, data storage, documentation, privacy, civil rights, policies, and procedures. Next slide. So here is a list of standards uh, that have links that can take you to the information that will help guide you even more through the process of things that you might want to look at. Next slide. Um, this is about drone responders, uh, org. It's a, it's a free membership and the registration is free. So go to drone responders.org. We have the largest collection of public safety UAS documents, SOPs, best practices, lessons learned, training information, and more. And we hope that you can join us and become a part of drone responders. And I thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Charles. Um, so the work being done by drone responders is quite impressive and you've all really uh, done a lot of legwork pulling together critical infrastructure or critical information for anyone interested in developing and maturing a drone program and avoiding some of those common pitfalls. So for everyone attending today, we'll have additional resources from you that we'll be sharing following this session. Now, next, I would like to ask everyone to participate in the second question in our mentee poll to give us a better understanding of how drones and imagery are currently getting used in the community by your agencies for response, recovery, and or resilience efforts. And with that, I have the pleasure of introducing someone Napsig has also worked very closely with for some time, Mr. Austin Worcester. Austin is the Senior Program Manager for um, small UAS at headquarters in Civil Air Patrol. He is currently leading and manages the largest small UAS fleet organization in the U.S. He's a retired assistant fire chief and paramedic. Mr. Worcester has spent over 35 years in public safety and emergency management, leading operations at the local, state, federal, and international levels. With that, over to you, Austin. Hey, good morning or afternoon, everyone, uh, depending on where you are. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to come and talk about uh, my favorite organization um, that I'm representing. Uh, next slide, Terry. Uh, the Civil Air Patrol is also known as the U.S. Air Force Auxiliary. It uh, was founded December the 1st, 1941, a week before Pearl Harbor. Um, and our folks served throughout World War II uh, performing sub-chasing missions uh, looking for uh, German submarines uh, along the coast and uh, in many cases were armed and able to bomb uh, those submarines. Uh, since then, the United, uh, the Air Force has adopted us in 1947 with the birth of the Air Force. We officially became the auxiliary of the Air Force and we assumed a non-combatant role, uh, which continues to this day. Uh, we perform 80% of the sorties listed on the first Air Force ATO, that's uh, their tasking order each day across the United States. And we currently perform about 90% of aviation search and rescue that is tasked by the Air Force Rescue Center at Tyndall Air Force Base. We're in all 50 states, the District of Columbia, and we're also in Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands with 66,000 plus volunteers. Uh, that number often swells to as many as 68,000 and it's uh, fairly fluid, but it's supported by less than 200 full-time employees such as myself who work uh, out of Maxwell Air Force Base in Alabama. We're the largest single owner of Cessna aircraft in the world with about uh, 570 aircraft. And we're also the largest single owner of UAS in the nation with more than 1,800. We're rapidly approaching uh, 2,000 aircraft uh, and we'll probably be at about 2,100 aircraft by the end of our fiscal year in September. Next slide, please. Just an example of some of the aircraft that we use for our Air Force assigned missions. We are um, bound under Title 10 when we're functioning as an agent of the US government or supporting a federal agency, be it the Air Force or a civilian agency. Uh, we're required under Title 10 um, and are prohibited from using Chinese-based drones or purchasing them. So these are examples of the aircraft that we're currently using uh, to meet that requirement and provide the, uh, the needs for our customers. This is an Event 38 E384. It is a fixed wing aircraft uh, with a stay time of about 90 minutes overhead. Uh, it's 
equipped with a Sony R10C mapping camera that can map a thousand acres on one battery. Uh, we also have the E386 variant that is parachute equipped uh, that allows us for flight over people waiver. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the two rotorcraft that we tend to use is the Instant Eye Mark III Generation 4. It has both inherent electro optical in the 4K range, along with a high end 640 by 512 long wave infrared system. Um, with the mission battery, our hover times are about 60 minutes, um, and we can equip it with a variety of mission packages, including uh, drop mechanisms and special radio relay systems in the wave relay uh, world. And then over on the right hand side is a T960. A uh, hexcopter, it's a fairly large hexcopter, and in this case, it's equipped with a LIDAR sensor that we used in Puerto Rico uh, that I'll talk about here in just a moment. Next slide, please. So our teams were deployed initially uh, to the southern part of Puerto Rico following the earthquakes at the end of, I believe it was December 28th. Our teams were on the ground shortly thereafter. And for the following two weeks, provided aerial imagery, um, flying over 100 sorties, delivering over 13,000 images, along with hours and hours of both infrared video, um, live stream video, and LIDAR sensing. Those teams um, were, this is an example, were the only folks who can, who were able to provide imagery in that first week of the disaster uh, because they were getting winds that were gusting over 50 miles per hour in many locations, which grounded the entire fixed wing fleet and prevented us from getting aircraft in the air. But we were able to get UAVs in the air, uh, which in this case provided the only aerial imagery. What you're seeing here is a combination of our team. Our team is able to provide both ground-based sensing, UAV sensing in the remote sensing area, the traditional fixed wing aircraft and we have a team of folks who are able to exploit and analyze satellite imagery. That makes us one of the few uh, agencies out there that can work in all four realms of remote sensing. In this case, uh, this was a cooperation between an aircraft crew using the Waldo XCAM sensor, which produces very high resolution 3D models. They identified a potential buckling in a uh, sewage treatment plants containment uh, tank. We dispatched a UAV team which was there within 20 minutes and overhead shortly after. They determined that, <coughs> excuse me, that, that the buckling was not a structural issue and that the tank was safe and no evacuations of the nearby subdivision was required. In a similar incident, uh, they did find cracking in a concrete water tower that required that the area be evacuated and then later the, the water tower was drained and then removed due to its uh, an instability. Next slide, please. One of the things that we've started doing is providing uh, FEMA some assistance in the recovery phase. In this case, uh, this was following Hurricane Maria the entire island's power grid was uh, disrupted and the repairs, contracted repairs had been completed. They asked us to fly the entire 230 kilovolt and 115 kilovolt uh, power grid to identify areas that were gonna be problematic uh, because the island is still on a single point of failure in its power grid, it wouldn't take much to cause a problem. Um, as you can see in the bottom right hand corner, within 30 minutes of our teams flying the Waldo X cam, they found uh, several incidents where a tower wasn't um, as stable as it should be. And in this case, a 230 kilovolt line that was crossed um, during the quote unquote repairs. Uh, that allowed FEMA to go back in and, and make some decisions uh, our entire Puerto Rico mission that lasted six weeks between our fixed wing aircraft and our UAVs cost FEMA under a million dollars and they were doing that to make a 60 billion dollar decision um, on repair of infrastructure in Puerto Rico. It was a cost-effective return on their dollar. Next slide please. 
So one of our new sensors are the Waldo XCAM sensors. It allows us to take uh, either what we call 2D plus in strip imagery of large scale areas, but we can also fly circular patterns over specific areas and produce large scale, usually five kilometer by five kilometer squares of high resolution 3D model data that allows the, the emergency manager to get right in there and determine what's going on with that critical infrastructure. In this case, this is a road washed out post uh, tropical cyclone system in North Carolina. Next picture, please. In Puerto Rico, we deployed for the first time um, LIDAR sensors. And using these LIDAR sensors, we were able to um, map areas post earthquake that had already been subjected to LIDAR sensing from traditional aircraft and from satellites, um, both pre-Hurricane Maria, post-Hurricane Maria, and now we're doing this post earthquake and in this example, we uh, imaged this warehouse collapse. You can see the UAV image in the upper left, a ground image in the bottom left, the overall LIDAR sensing, which gave us a point cloud from which to build 3D models. But the most interesting one here is we were able to take a cross section of that LIDAR data, and you can see the debris pile from the warehouse. And we're able to do volumetric calculations based off of that. And we can also do that with 3D visual modeling, but it's more accurate with LIDAR. And this enabled FEMA to determine how many dump trucks, how much equipment it's gonna to take to clear that um, debris pile that was blocking a road. It's much more cost effective to do that than to have a FEMA inspector standing there uh, physically logging the dump trucks as they come in and out, and how much debris they have in them, which is the past practice that they've been using. Um, next slide, please. Additionally, our, our LIDAR data, we were able to take that LIDAR data that um, was pre-Hurricane Maria, post-Hurricane Maria, and then compare that to the Puerto Rico earthquake LIDAR data. And in this case, you can see the building in the upper right. Uh, there was some question as to whether it was damaged uh, during the hurricane the year before, or uh, was it damaged from the earthquake? Using the data that was captured in 2018, um, post hurricane, you can see the building was upright and had not shifted at all. It was level. And in the red line is the data we collected, which clearly showed the building suffered its damage in the earthquake. We were able to do this across um, essentially one entire town, which allowed FEMA to um, assign damage to a specific uh, disaster. Uh, it's a monetary thing for them, but it was a much more cost effective way of mapping this. Next slide, please. Using our, our Waldo cameras, this is a good example. Tornadoes are very easy for us to image using the Waldo sensor because it's a long tornado track and it, we can both use the a combination of sensors, both our traditional fixed wing flying the, the Waldo X cam in its 2D mode, taking that strip imagery, or they can begin to circle the damage and produce 3D imagery. Plus we can also take that UAV Im imagery down there on the ground over that critical infrastructure or building of interest. And we can meld all of that and provide an extremely high resolution uh, 3D image down to two centimeters per pixel, uh, which gives you just an incredible view of what you've got going on, what kind of operation uh, for reconstruction is this gonna take uh, debris modeling and all of those items melded together. But now we've taken this to another level. Next uh, slide, please. So following the Arkansas tornado, FEMA and uh, Civil Air Patrol, and there's some FEMA folks out there in the audience we work very well with, um, and their headquarters remote sensing office, uh, worked with one of their contractors to develop an artificial intelligence method of doing damage assessment based on the imagery we're providing. And in this case, you can see the green buildings are unaffected, yellow buildings are affected buildings, orange are damaged, um, red has major damage and purple are destroyed. You can clearly see the tornado path um, using that AI. 
and it allows you to look at that quick, um, you know, down and dirty damage assessment. Uh, next slide. As we get a little closer, you can see how we applied. And this was one of the earliest applications and things got better and better as we went along. Um, again, the yellow are buildings that are affected. They may have lost shingles, had a window knocked out, something along that lines. The orange have some level of structural damage to them. The red have a significant amount of structural damage and the purple are destroyed buildings. This allows you to do that quick down and dirty um, financial calculation for your public assistance money, getting it to you quicker. Uh, next slide, please. This is that close up and this is one of the um, more refined uh, AI runs on the Arkansas tornado. Again, the same color scheme applies. Following this one, we use this in Mississippi when they had um, several days of uh, EF3 and EF4 tornadoes affecting the same region of Southern Mississippi on Easter Sunday of this year and the following weekend. And we flew those damage paths with both the XCAM and UAVs and then applied this AI solution. We found and then compared it, we, our turnaround was about 24 hours to Mississippi Emergency Management and it blew their socks off um, and they were very impressed with this because we found that with their ground-based um, inspectors looking for damage and compared it to the AI system, we found the AI was more accurate. The AI also and the imagery from the air found buildings that the ground inspectors couldn't see because of tree damage and blocked roads that they just flat out couldn't see or couldn't get to uh, the aircraft to pick those buildings up and classified them for them. Uh, next slide, please. So this is my contact information. I do have a short video for you. If you're a governmental entity and you have an immediate request for us, please contact our National Operations Center. Uh, the email is there. There's always a duty officer on after normal business hours. It's an 800 number and we can get our resources to you. Our goal um, in general is to get an, one of our fixed wing aircraft overhead, weather permitting, within two to three hours of your event and get our UAV teams to you within four hours. Those are our goals right now. Um, Terry, if you queue up that video for, for you, we'd just like to show you a short video of some of the things we're doing. Thanks, Terry. Thanks for having us. If you need anything, please feel free to reach out and I'll be happy to talk to you. Thank you, Austin. It is impressive to see how much Civil Air Patrol has grown in its capacity and is really at the forefront of using all types of imagery, including LIDAR and 3D and AI for disaster response. And what is even more exciting is to see the upper operationalization of AI during recent disasters to support the EMP community. 24 hour turnaround time is just remarkable. So thank you again for being with us. And finally, I'd like to welcome Christopher Todd. Chris is the executive director of the Airborne International Response Team. He is a certified emergency manager 
an FAA Part 107 remote pilot who has flown a wide assortment of disaster response missions with small UAS. Todd, Mr. Todd also serves as a command staff member of the Florida Region 7 All Hazards Incident Management Team based out of Palm Beach County Fire Rescue Department. Thank you so much for being with us today, Chris. I'll turn it over to you. Hey, thank you, Terry. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. And I've got to say, it's really impressive to see what Chief Warner is doing with drone responders, what Austin's doing with the Civil Air Patrol, some really amazing work and missions being undertaken with unmanned aircraft systems. So it's, uh, it's just an honor to be in such great company. So um, let's kind of get into our portion of, of the presentation. And, you know, this photo, this is one of our pilots for air. I'll tell you a little bit more about uh, our organization in just a second. But I think this photo really embodies what we're all about. Um, we send teams out into disasters with small unmanned aircraft systems to start gra um, gathering situational intelligence. And this was uh, right after Hurricane Michael up in Panama City, Florida back in 2018. So about AIR, the Airborne International Response Team. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization founded in 2017 in Miami, Florida. And most of you probably know Miami is right in the heart of Hurricane Alley. Our specialty again is offering aerial intelligence capabilities for disaster management and other special projects focused on small unmanned aircraft systems and then GIS products. Uh, we're also a producer of world-class content and events. Uh, we typically use our Drone Responders brand for that. Drone Responders uh, is a, a program under air. We are very proud to serve as the official home for that program led by Chief Werner. So getting into it a little bit more, uh, you know, you, you had your mentee poll at the beginning of, uh, of this, and it was really interesting to see that about 40% of you already have a program, 23% of you watching are working on a program and 23% don't have a program. And we've also conducted some research as Chief Werner showed earlier um, with air and drone responders to kind of understand what is happening in the drones for good in the public safety sector. And I think one of the key pieces I wanted to share with you here today is how important everyone believes it is to share, to be able to track and understand how different organizations in the public safety realm around the world are using drones for good. And, and our data showed that 97% of survey respondents really believe that it, it is important. So webinars like this, um, you know, serve to kind of establish connections and, and share what's happening, but there is a greater need to understand what's happening. And, and we're going to be bringing that information to you as a, uh, as the, this sector evolves. Here's another really quick uh, photo from Hurricane Michael. This is in uh, Lynn Haven, Florida. You can see some of the damage. You can see the lines queuing up for food and water distribution. And you know th this, this is a pretty dramatic photo taken by a drone, but without any GIS reference point, if, if we didn't know it, it was Lynn Haven, if we didn't know it was Hurricane Michael, it's just what I would call disaster art. So GIS really is the key to all this. And you know, our job is, is somewhat pointless if we can't tie um, the imagery we're collecting with georeference data on, on the ground. So again, we, we really kind of focus with AIRT on hurricane response missions. The typical missions we'll fly are situational awareness and public information, how bad is bad, as you heard Chief Werner talking about earlier. Uh, we'll do target search, which will then facilitate the, the rescue damage assessment, damage mapping and documentation. We work uh, a great deal with power restoration missions, telecom inspection and insurance claims. And eventually we're, we're starting to get to experiment with delivering aid and relief supplies uh, using drones and other unmanned systems. And there's a lot of research going on, not only here in the US but around the world on that. So it's really a, a new exciting forefront of how these systems are being used. Um, this is a video I'm going to show you from Hurricane Michael, and, and we had a couple of our air teams embedded uh, unofficially with uh, Florida Task Force One out of Miami-Dade County Fire Rescue, and um, we're, I'm going to show you kind of how we use drones in a way that wasn't really planned, uh, but we it, it was kind of an ad hoc mission that we assembled due to all of the trees and all the timber that were in the road. The, uh, the search squads could not get through certain roads. They couldn't get up certain driveways to affect the windshield survey for damage assessment. So we turned to unmanned systems and this is gonna tell that story.
Uh, so that really kind of, you know, tells the story and how we innovated on the fly using these systems. Uh, we've learned certain lessons throughout the last several hurricanes we've responded to. In 2017 with Irma, we learned that logistics are really essential for success. If you don't have a plan as far as how you're gonna pre-position the teams, what supplies you're gonna use, how you're gonna recharge batteries, et cetera, um, you know, your, your mission is going to fail. In 2018, in Hurricane Michael, which you just saw some footage from, um, we learned that we really needed to maintain our, our, our operational plan for disconnected environments. That all these fancy apps we use and all this technology that we've grown so accustomed to is really limited once you don't have mobile connectivity. Once the telecom networks are down and you can't reroute resources, uh, the only comms you have are short distance radio, that becomes very problematic when you're when you're training and exercising using different tools that are processing data in the cloud and suddenly you can't do that. And in 2019 uh, in Dorian, we, we really put those two lessons uh, to, to use and you'll see an example of that in a second, but we learned that relationships and flexibility are paramount. Even though your mission might be going to, to uh, fly drones, don't be surprised if you're gonna be unloading a school bus full of water and, and building goodwill within the local community. That's really essential to, uh, to affecting the, the response. Here's another um, example from Hurricane Michael. This is Panama City, uh, freight train blown over. There's uh, power restoration going on outside the shot up in the left corner. But what you, you can really see here is the trees and you can tell the wind direction, not only from the train being knocked over, but looking at the branches and, and the way those trees split halfway up the trunk um, really tells the story about how fierce those winds were, as well as the directional pattern of the storm, and much easier to get this data from the air using small drones than it is standing on the ground and, and trying to, uh, to figure that out. So I mentioned Hurricane Dorian, uh, Northern Bahamas last year. We did respond in partnership with the Florida Region 7 All Hazards Incident Management Team. Uh, we first went to Freeport in Eastern Grand Bahama Island, where we assessed the University of the Bahamas as well as some residential areas. Uh, we later went to Marsh Harbor and Great Abaco Island, which was the scene of the mud shanty town. Um, really, you know, you, you see some people out there um, in awe and, and Marsh Harbor was just desolate. It's unlike the US where we have supplies flowing in uh, from the internet, uh, the, the interstate highway system um, on an island like in the Bahamas, it's really airlift and a little bit of sea lift and it's, it's few and far between. So it, uh, it really gave us a lot of respect for dealing with those types of situations and learning how to operate unmanned systems in those types of uh, situations. So this is uh, the video, um, just a, a short reel we shot from Hurricane Dorian in the Bahamas. What you're seeing there is the University of the Bahamas, the North Campus on East Grand Bahama Island, just uh, east of Freeport. The reason this school was so important is, is the Bahamas' main economic engine is tourism. And this is the university where they train most of the young people who are gonna be serving as mid-level and senior level leadership at the various resorts and tourist destinations um, throughout the Northern Bahamas. And it was devastated. So if they can't get this back online, if they can't um, you know, start teaching these kids again, their economic en engine for the country is gonna be in disarray. So we were using this to really capture the imagery. We were the first team out there uh, to provide them with a rough damage assessment that they could then um, start the planning for how they were gonna rebuild and recover uh, this university from, from the hurricane. So we got a variety of shots. You can see how bad the, not just the wind damage, but the storm surge. And that was one of the unique things about Dorian uh, is that most hurricanes are typically either water events or they're wind events. This was both a wind and a water event, that Cat 5 hurricane that stalled over the Northern Bahamas for almost 40 hours. Now you're seeing um, scenes from some of the residential areas we surveyed. These homes were built to Miami-Dade uh, hurricane standards designed to withstand a Cat 3 or Cat 4. But when all these, when you see the storm surge go through and take out that ground floor, it doesn't matter how good the roof is fastened to the structure of the house. Uh, it's just total devastation. And many of these were walkaways. We saw uh, the families coming back, just taking a look and grabbing what they could and, 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 uh, and taking off. But using the unmanned systems, using drones for this, again, we're able to assess a wider area much more quickly as, as Austin showed you. Um, and get this information directly to the local people who can start making decisions. 
And now you're looking at Marsh Harbor. This was the mud, uh, what the Bahamians call a shanty town, uh, comprised largely of Haitian um, refugees who were living here. And the storm surge came in and, and just basically devastated and wiped out um, this entire neighborhood or shanty town, as it's called. And what we had with us was a, a new software program from PIX4D called React. It was then in beta version, but it basically was, was designed to allow us to do exactly what we needed to do here, which was um, create a high definition aerial map of the damage area in an austere environment with no mobile connectivity. So we were able to fly a drone um, over this area in, in a mapping sequence gather the imagery we needed, and in the field on a laptop computer, process it within about 25 minutes. And, and there we have an output map that can be used and given to USAR teams, search and rescue personnel to start affecting the actual search. So I'm gonna show you, um, again, it was a field test of PIX4D React, rapid processing under austere conditions. And it's really about the workflow. And those of you who are specialized in GIS, you know this, that workflow is so essential to all of this, but what is the desired output for the end user? Uh, we have to look at the remote sensing capabilities, the range of the aircraft, the number of flights or batteries we have with us, uh, recharging capability. And all this is, again, we're carrying this in, in, in a backpack to, to a disaster scene like this. So this is the output product from that first flight um, in, in the flat using PIX4D. And when we're, I mean, this is a screenshot, but when you're actually in the software application, you can zoom in and get some real detailed information uh, to start planning search and rescue operations or in search and recovery operations uh, as it would be in, in this case. So as we've learned so many times, we've got to work with our GIS teams to really understand what you need, what you're looking for, or what the end user is looking for, for product deliverables. And then it becomes a math equation that we work backwards for. And, and again, I mentioned how important it is to train and exercise this. Uh, we're partners with Florida International University's Academy for International Disaster Preparedness. This is a group of their students in the disaster management program where we're teaching them about the, the capabilities of drones and the mapping capabilities for GIS. And we'll, we, we exercise that every year. So some of the tips for success, just to share with you, um, aerial imagery, again, without GIS intelligence, it's really nothing more than disaster art. Your end product becomes a math equation. Work backwards to determine key variables. Uh, I think it's important to remember you can't be an expert in everything. You've got to know your strengths and your weaknesses and you've got to fill the gaps. And again, train and exercise your workflow or you're going to end up wasting time and resources and, and nobody wants to see that happen. Um, I'm not going to play this video, but this is a uh, drone to map for ArcGIS. This is software from Esri that allows you to take the imagery um, from the drone and do some really amazing things with it and then um, incorporate it right into the ArcGIS system. They've also got a, an, another software program called SightScan, which was made by a company called 3D Robotics and Esri uh, acquired SightScan. But if, if you're using the Esri environment for your GIS operations and you wanna fly drones and you want seamless integration of the imagery, I encourage you to, to look both at drone to map and SightScan and, and, uh, and, and get more information about those two products from Esri. Uh, again, my name is Christopher Todd. Feel free to contact me with any information uh, or any questions. We are always looking for volunteers who want to serve, especially GIS analysts and, uh, and folks who are, have experience with disasters. So feel free to reach out to me. And Terry, back to you. Thank you so much, Chris. We're thrilled to have you with us today and to get to highlight the capabilities of Airborne International Response Team and what you all can bring to bear, the types of missions you all can support. I have to say the telescopic shots you shared were really cool. I mean, these types of capabilities that you, Charles and Austin shared are really game changers in our ability to improve the outcomes of survivors. Thank you. So uh, with that, you know, technology is great um, and the applications we saw today are really impressive, but to truly leverage these kinds of capabilities, there's some work needed to, done, to be done to prepare. Um, and to learn from industry leaders like our panelists and take advantage of best practices and lessons learned from pre previous events. So to get you started, we've listed just a few initial steps. Um, I'm sorry, we're missing a, a URL there. We'll put it in the chat. If you have not already, you can become a member of the Drone Responders Public Safety Alliance to access an online collection of public safety UAS documents that 
includes SOPs and best practices, lesson learned, training information, and more. You can learn how to hone your skills volunteering as a JS analyst or field manager for Airborne International Response Team. You can reach out to your local Civil Air Patrol unit to form that relationship now if you haven't already. And like any other admission partner, bringing them in prior to a disaster and defining how you can work together is critical to ensuring your success. And finally, as you heard today and may already be aware, technology has moved beyond just capturing imagery. A lot of research continues to be done in this space, and I'd encourage you to look at academia and R&D community for potential partnerships to tackle your unique challenges as it relates to small and large UAS collection. For example, listed here is the University of Maryland UAS test site. And with that, I want to, I think, check with our mentee results. So no surprise that imagery is heavily used to identify and assess damage. It's quite appropriate that we heard some of the very latest innovations with imagery for damage assessments by our panelists. This is a pretty broad usage for um, imagery during um, response and see mitigation and planning and preparedness. So thank you all for contributing to that. So uh, with that, um, for technologists and geospatial analysts, there are a lot of resources on available technology and platforms to aid you in using imagery. And this is by no means an exhaustive list, but a few that we wanted to highlight. Um, first, FEMA has recently launched their Remote Sensing Resources Hub, and this is a great resource to understand the types of imagery collected for disasters based on size and scope, as well as for what purpose they are most appropriate for. And you can explore by type of imagery collection or hazard type and see more examples of how imagery and AI was used in recent disasters. So uh, Chris mentioned, uh, for those of you who use the Esri platform, Esri provides a wide variety of foundational imagery or pre-disaster imagery. If you attended the virtual Esri user conference, there were several sessions on drone applications, including the ones Chris showed, drone to map and site scan. And there's some good documentation online as to why you might choose one over the other. And finally, there are user communities in GeoNet that support those with questions or providing resources. If you're unfamiliar with GeoNet, it is where GIS and geospatial professional communities connect, collaborate, and share often around specific topics. So what's next? Um, I wanted to bring your attention to a number of events on the horizon. This is our lineup of upcoming prep tech talks. Our next webinar is in just a couple weeks on August 13th. And that one will be on the indoor frontier, exploring emerging technologies for first responders in the indoor environment. In September, we'll be sharing results from a collaboration between NAPSIG and the ERISA Community Resilience Task Force entitled The Verdict is Out, Decrypting Risk, Resilience, Social Vulnerability, Data, and Indices. And finally, we had so much content we wanted to cover today that we opted to make this a two-part series. In October, we'll be picking up where we left off for part two. In addition to our prep tech talk series, we hold an open community forum. Um, this is also a part two of our COVID-19 technology and GIS hot wash series. This effort is led by the Pandemic GIS Task Force, a collaboration between NAPSIG, NISJIC, and ERISA. On August 27th is our next EM Geo Forum. And that is a virtual webinar series that we support in partnership with FEMA's Response Geospatial Office. Our next topic will be on wildfires, and we'll have another extraordinary panel that will be sharing new resources and workflows for the emergency management community for wildfires. And last but certainly not least, our annual Innovation Summit for Preparedness and Resilience, or INSPIRE, event has been moved to April so that we can hopefully have an in-person event. It will be held in Salt Lake City, Utah. For those new to our flagship event, INSPIRE is the nation's only summit dedicated to fostering innovation in policy and technology for preparedness and resilience. And the event brings together public safety leaders, first responders, GIS professionals, and technologists from across the nation for a one-of-a-kind event to connect with thought leaders and experts, discover how your peers are innovating, and then apply new ideas to your work. So to learn more about INSPIRE, you can access recording materials from previous summits as well as materials from our other events on our events page. And this is also where you can access the recording and materials from our session today. Um, we have a superstar panel with us today that we're uh, feverishly answering all of your questions in the Q&A. And those will be um, on our events page published with all of the materials and recordings from today. So you'll get to see all the answers um, for that posted there as well. 
So I want to thank them all again for their work and for presenting with us today. We hope to see you all back for part two in October. With that, we'd like to close it out. Everyone stay well and stay safe.